www.radio.pl Welcome everybody from the house of Mr. Vladimir Bukowski, a man who actually showed by his example, by his life, that few people can change the reality. He never gave up and he was great inspiration for everybody who loved the uh, freedom. I know it's big words, but a big man. Uh, today we are asked Mr. Bukowski to make a few comments about uh, the growing deficiency of democracy in Europe. That was the one of the bottom lines of his book, Judgment in Moscow. In your book you wrote about convergency, the theory that uh, actually the West, the Western countries merge into one big organism with Russia. With Russia. Well, to begin with, uh, convergence and theory uh, came very early in 20th century. As you know, historically, the uh, socialist uh, movement in the world got split at the beginning of the 20th century into what they called Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference between them was not very significant. Simply, Mensheviks wanted to achieve the same goals only by more uh, slow means reformists rather than revolutionary. Mm -hmm. But the fact remains that uh, while Bolsheviks have won in the East, the Mensheviks have won in the West. And that's what lots of people in former communist countries did not realize. I didn't realize it too until I came to the West and suddenly discovered that they have more socialism than we used to have in the Soviet Union, simply because socialists have won here. I mean, look at Britain. They have the same uh, medical system as the Soviet Union used to have. It's free, you know, and as being free in the Soviet Union it didn't work, and being free in the West it doesn't work either. So that's, uh, you suddenly realize that they introduced a lot of socialism into their lives throughout 20th century, gradually, slowly, not through revolution, right? And the theory was, mostly popular among the left wing and the socialist parties, that one day this divide between Bolsheviks and Mensheviks will be closed. That Bolsheviks will become milder, they will abandon their uh, uh, revolutionary zeal and violent nature, they'll become what they call socialism with human face. Yeah. While the West would uh, increase their uh, socialist uh, features, and then there will be no difference, there will be convergence between yeah. this between the West and the East. So, I, uh, convergence is, first of all, ideological concept, which brings together these two worlds and uh, creates one world out of them, uh, which, according to this uh, concept, is going to be paradise. There will be no social problems, no wars, no poverty, no crime, as usual with socialist utopia. They give you a beautiful picture of the, of the ult, uh, ultimate triumph of their concept. New brave world. Yeah, but, uh, and uh, it, it was in theory for a long time. Throughout 20th century, if you look uh, uh, on the relation between the West and the East, it was always these two things which uh, uh, formed the political reality. Uh, when Bolsheviks felt themselves strong, they would fight against Mensheviks. When they feel themselves uh, threatened, uh, in crisis, in difficulty, they would always pretend to be Mensheviks. Like Gorbachev with his so-called new thinking. Read his new thinking. New thinking is socialist. It's not communist. You know, that's very simple. So they would always indicate to the Western uh, fellow travelers that they're about to change. And therefore, uh, the left forces of the West come to their rescue, helping them. As soon as the crisis is over, they will go back to their former positions as Bolsheviks and will reject socialists. So, socialists throughout the 20th century were taken uh, by this deception several times. They helped Lenin during an AP, they helped Stalin during a war, they, you know, they helped uh, Brezhnev during detente policy. It was always going in circles. And always this, always this uh, carrot of, um, of, of convergency would be used to, uh, to uh, attract the socialist donkey. You know, it was very, very good device for them. 
Now, ultimately, in the middle of the 80s, they suddenly understood that the crisis of socialism is everywhere, in the West and in the East. In the East, Gorbachev started his perestroika because socialism did not produce anymore, it was bankrupt. In the East, in the West, they had the same problem coming to them when socialism uh, became a big burden on national economies. They couldn't cope with it. So they decided that they would have a convergency. Uh, and the agreement between Gorbachev and the Western uh, left-wing parties was formulated in the middle of the 80s, uh, with Gorbachev coming up and announcing a new policy of our common European home, exactly. he said. So in the West it was formulated like a European idea. In reality it was a socialist idea. Uh, and uh, in the East it was formulated like a reform of the Soviet Union. So there was attempt at convergency. Now, attempt was uh, unsuccessful, as we know, because the Soviet system could not withstand this degree of uh, <coughs> this degree of freedom. As soon as it was given, people took everything and they, they overthrown the system in Eastern Europe as well as in the, in, in the former Soviet Union. <coughs> so the convergency stopped because there was nothing to be converged with. Uh, it continued in the West uh, under the name of European Union, but it did not go in the East. And gradually it started absorbing the East European countries into its system, uh, with the Eastern Europe becoming members of the European Union uh, and thus being connected to this, uh, uh, to this concept, to this uh, project. And uh, finally, in the Soviet Union, or rather in Russia, uh, we had a, a restoration process uh, started by uh, Putin and others. With the KGB coming to power, they have renewed the old policies of the Soviet Union in foreign relations, trying to restore the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union everywhere, uh, and returning some elements of Soviet system in, in Russia. Uh, and therefore, once it was consolidated, it renewed its effort of having convergence with the West. So, in today's world, Putin is very happy about the European Union. I mean, he, um, he is very critical of everything in the West, be it national governments or international organizations, except one, European Union. He's very uh, full of praises for it. In his articles, in his speeches, he, you remember his speech in Munich which uh, kind of alerted everyone because it was so hostile. It was hostile to everything but the European Union. Just look at it. So he suddenly felt that he can now return to the old project. Wow, that's amazing. Is there any chance to actually reverse this project? If there is a chance, what can we do actually, we normal people, like ordinary people, to change? Well, there is always a chance. I mean, if we saw a chance in the Soviet system, to fight against it, there is always a chance. I mean, the European Union is its, uh, its infancy, it's still developing, and it already has a, a lethal disease. They can't cope with it. I mean, as usual, so socialist utopia is beautiful, except there is no money for it. So they're running out of money, as it so often happens with socialist systems. And the European Union is not exception. They're now in deep crisis of this so-called sovereign debt which is in reality a cost of socialism, which the national economies cannot, cannot bear. Uh, so uh, it, it looks like they're going to be bankrupt, like Soviet Union, uh, very soon. Some people claim that actually Germans are using, are using actually money instead of, of, instead of army to, to take control over the euro. That might have been their project at the beginning, but if you look at the situation today, Germany is paying for everyone. Germany is the main source of money today for the rest of Europe. Look, who is giving money to Greece, the bailout money? Germany. Who is giving money to uh, Portugal? Who is giving money to uh, Ireland? It all comes from Germany. So. And they themselves are not doing well. I mean, last year economy uh, shows zero growth. Zero. That is very dangerous. That's a recession. So, 
I mean, now I'd like to some, ask something about Poland. We are we came here from Poland, so you know we are kind of Polo-centric, sure. which is obvious. And from January the first, there was free crossing border between Kaliningrad mm -hmm. district and Poland. I mean, this this shows that there is what can how could you interpret that? Is it actually the Congregation, I mean, process of congregation, or just some people claim that it's actually recreating the the pr up East Prussia project. Uh, well, you have a government in Poland now, which is for some reason better known to them, is very friendly to Russia. I can't explain it. They came to power with the intention of improving relations. Yeah. And uh, I remember someone from Poland interviewed me on that subject, and I immediately said, uh, uh, how can you improve relations with KGB? What we have in Russia today is a KGB system. I had to deal with KGB for 50 years of my life. You can't improve relations with them unless you become their agent. It's, it doesn't happen. KGB, by its mentality, does not recognize partners, does not recognize friends. You're either enemy or agent. There is nothing in between. If you try to improve relations with them, it means that you're slowly becoming their agent, nothing else. So you can't, you can't even theoretically improve relations with KGB. And what's you going, what's, what's Poland is going to do? Becoming agent of, of, of uh, KGB Russia? Uh, I, I can't understand the uh, desire of improving relations. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm afraid I was right, I mean, since then, the Polish policy toward Russia becomes so ridiculous, so uh, appeasing, so placating, that uh, it frankly reminds me of old time when, when, uh, when Warsaw was under control of Moscow. Well, I mean, they are very appeasing, very helpful. It reminds me actually of the case of Afghanistan, like all prior, before the conflict, or, or the governments actually were very, very uh, lenient to, to Russia. Yeah. All of them were actually their friends, and that was the, the end was the war. Uh, you also said that socialism as such uh, quarrels, I mean, you know, put the conflict between nations. What can we expect in this situation, actually? Well, I mean, Thank your your you second see. question relates to Europe, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Well, to my uh, knowledge, uh, the things, the relations between the nations and the European Union becomes worse and worse. I mean, initially, we would respect each other's sovereignty. We would be very friendly. We would be trading, and there was no particular animosity between the countries. Uh, now we have a very bitter uh, relations when. Uh, when uh, uh, we are uh, supposed to be donors for countries like Greece and Portugal and Ireland, and people here quite rightly ask themselves, why should I sacrifice my uh, level of, uh, of uh, living, standards of living, for the sake of uh, some people in Greece who don't want to work? I mean, look, they have social benefits bigger than we have. They retire at the age of 55. We retire at the age of 65, so we have to work 10 years longer than Greeks, and yet we're helping Greeks. Why? It's a usual thing uh, when, when people try to become united, like one kolkhoz, the first or communal flat, something they don't understand here, they never lived in communal flats. I was born in a communal flat, I, I grew up there till the age of 14. I remember very well that relations between neighbors become very hostile because you have to decide who is paying for what. The light and toilet, who is paying for light and toilet? Who is, <laughs> who is, who is paying for heating? Who is paying for what? For number of people, for number of families, for the size of your room, how you divide the cost. And uh, there is no good solution. So therefore, the same is happening in Europe right now. Who is paying for whom? You know, it's, it's a very obvious question. Uh, and of course, they will end up in enormous hostility. Enormous hostility. 
add up to that, that the common policy on immigration in Europe made us all flooded with immigrants from third world. Forget about Poles coming and working here. Poles work, Poles earn money, Poles go home. When you have Pakistanis coming here, they don't work, they go for social benefits. They never work here, but yet they're entitled to have social benefits. So millions of them come, and the, the, the budget is supposed to pay for them. That means we are supposed to pay for them, for no reason at all. So that generates a lot of hostilities. We have very tense relations with Muslim communities here. We have, we have very tense relations in Europe. It comes to a point of mutual hatred. Uh, we will end up like Soviet Union, bankrupt and hostile to each other. Now you are talking about Nigel, Nigel Farage. What do you think about this party? Is oh, the yeah, he's, they are very good friends of mine. I mean, I've met them before Farage. I actually uh, uh, persuaded Farage to become the leader. He didn't want to. Uh, he was modest. He was saying, no, I'm not that good politician. And I said, no, no, don't worry, you'll do. You're very good, articulate, you make good speeches, you should be a leader. So I persuaded him to become a leader. And they are very good friends of mine, so I always support them whenever I can. Are there any any other, could you could you show, I mean, could you name any other uh, parties, groups in Europe, actually, who could make some coalition, some free pro-freedom pro coalition in Europe to stop this, actually? Yeah, we flag? already have it. They, they, they have a coalition in the European Parliament, which was called, I think, Freedom and Democracy or something like that, Independence and Democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they would unite in the grouping in the European Parliament the uh, parties from uh, Holland, you know, which are uh, against the European Union, uh, from Denmark, from uh, all over the world, from Italy. So they work together already. They have a, um, a fraction in the European Parliament. So, uh, yes, they are cooperating all across the board. We're trying. It's still very small. Because, you know, majority of people prefer to vote for the parties which have bigger power, bigger clout. Uh, and that's a mistake, because these parties betray them. They betray them to Europe. And uh, the only parties which uh, fight against this European bureaucracy are the smaller parties. The big parties don't do that. And it's, uh, uh, they reckon it's to their advantage to be in Europe because it makes them completely irresponsible. It's very convenient. You see, they are politicians, and yet they have no responsibility. Because they would always say, it's not our decision, it's European decision. We, we cannot change that. You know, it's very convenient for politicians. They can always escape responsibility. And also, when they retire, instead of going back to normal life and trying to earn money, they go to Europe and become commissars, uh, doing nothing, earning a huge amount of money, uh, which are not taxed because it's an international organization, and they have uh, immunity from prosecution for life. It's a paradise for a politician. So they all love it. The establishment loves this idea of European Union, but the rank and file people hate it. In Britain, uh, the public opinion polls indicate that uh, something like 83 to 87 percent is against the European Union. But we are not asked. Uh, uh, for referendum. If we have a referendum tomorrow on, on membership in the EU, Britain would vote against it immediately. And they know it, that's why we're never allowed to have any referendum. So don't you think, I mean, what's your opinion about uh, Orban and all this uh, case in, in uh, Hungary? Would you agree with the supposition that the K, the, or, the Orban case party can 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 play the same role, analog, analogical role to this, which actually Solidarity played during in 1980? That it uh, can actually start the avalanche, which the, the the stone which can actually start the avalanche, which would you now bury the European Union. Well, I know Victor for many years. Even before he became prime minister, I mean, he twice became prime minister, and in both cases I've supported him all the time. 
Uh, he's a good man. He's very well educated. He graduated from Oxford. Uh, he, he does understand economy. He knows the West, which is very important. I mean, people like Tusk apparently don't understand the West. Uh, <laughs> but, but this guy understands the West. He knows how to play it. Uh, and of course, everyone is just against him right now because he made several very strong moves. Uh, not only he refused to accept this new treaty uh, offered to everyone, uh, he also made the central bank subordinated to parliament. And that takes the, uh, uh, the money-making process out of the hands of banks. So that, that is very kind, Dangerous of, very, very kind of challenging yeah. uh, to the West. So they were ganged against him. He's accused of being nationalist and uh, almost a fascist, total rubbish. He's, he's a democrat, he's a real democrat. And then he goes with his nation. He, of course, he's supposed to look uh, for the interests of his own people. That's, that's democracy. He was elected by three-quarter majority, unprecedented in Eastern Europe. Why? Because he defends the interests of the people. People like him. So that's what it is. And of course, he's a difficult character to deal with for European Union. He doesn't go under, you know, he, he resists, he stands. Now, with this new treaty, uh, which he refused to uh, uh, accept, he's not the only one. I, I understand that Czechs have also said they need a referendum on it. And Poles also are talking about a referendum or something like that on the issue. Uh, so there is a number of countries. Swedes, Swedes also said they need a referendum. They can't do that. Irish are supposed to have a referendum too. So there is a number of nations which did not accept right uh, from the start this, this new deal, which would uh, consume their sovereignty completely. You know, essentially this treaty is a last straw, after which there will be no sovereignty at all. Because the, even the budgets will be decided by European Union, your national budget, how much money you spend on what. It's all, all going to be decided in Brussels, and you will be given it. It's almost like with Moscow. But Moscow intervened in budgetary uh, only mar during martial law. During martial law, they would give Poles the budget, how they should administer it. But in, uh, before the martial law, they didn't. Poles decided for themselves how to spend their money. So, and now, in Europe, it's going to be like Poland under martial law. It will be decided in Brussels. <coughs> and of course, anyone who is a successful politician in his own country, why would they accept it? They want to make their own budget, according to constitution. They have to reflect the interests of their nation. So that's what the uh, at heart of the conflict between Viktor Urban and uh, um, and European Union. It's much deeper. Sir, in your book, Judgment in Moscow, you describe the suicidal hysteria of Western company for one side disarmament. Like in Poland two years ago, we had this huge uh, explosion of hatred towards own national uh, symbols, towards own religion, actually, which focused on, on the cross in, in Krakowskie Przedmieście. How you would comment on that? What happened actually to Poles? Who can benefit from that as well? Well, I mean, you refer to the period in the West, which was end of 70s, beginning of 80s, when there was a big uh, so-called peace movement or disarmament movement in the West, mostly inspired from Moscow, mostly, uh, but quite successful in the West at that time. Uh, uh, that was a part of Cold War. You know, the Soviets wanted the West to uh, not to be armed sufficiently so they can dictate their will to Europe, things like that. Uh, but what happens in Poland, is, I think, is slightly different. First, I don't think it's inspired from Moscow. I think it's uh, a young government doing that. Uh, second, it's, a, uh, it's an illusion that now you belong to a family of nations in Europe, therefore you don't need any uh, symbols of your sovereignty. Uh, it's a very naive thing. Very soon you will have a backlash when the nationalism in Poland will become a real uh, strong force because they would feel uh, their national identity attacked, their national traditions attacked. Uh, European Union is, uh, is um, uh, anti-clerical, anti-religious. 
the Pope, even the Pope had to protest against European Constitution because there is no mentioning of God in it. All constitutions on earth start with mentioning God. We are the people under God. Uh, and the only constitution which does mention God is European Constitution. And, and that's not coincidence. I mean, they are socialists, they are, they are left wing. They want to destroy religion, they want to destroy church. Uh, as, as a social institution, as a powerful uh, public institution. Uh, so it, it, it's the first thing which Poles, being Catholic nation, would encounter. Then if you look at the uh, main ideology of European Union, you would discover it's not only socialist, it's a politically correct. So they would start to introduce all political correct things into your country and you would have to accept it. It's already under European uh, Human Rights Charter, they approve the uh, same-sex marriages, for example. I mean, for a religious person, it's impossible to accept. Uh, in, even for not religious people like myself, it's difficult to accept. Uh, and they force it on you. So it will be a, a, a forced ideology called political correctness. Uh, and uh, that would immediately antagonize your population, I can assure you. Uh, it's uh, even here in Britain it really uh, annoys people, makes them furious about it, angry, uh, because it's a hostile ideology. Uh, and uh, Poland, of course, with its tradition of, of uh, rioting and mutineering, rebelling, uh, will be one of the first to rebel against it. Well, that's quite optimistic, I would say that uh, the nations will, will rebel, that there will be the, the backlash of, of, I mean, that there will be kind of re resurrection of, of this identity. But so far we can see this again, what you actually, what you, what, what you actually criticize with your, mm. uh, with your nation actually in judgment in Moscow, that people of your, gener they, of your generation, they, they actually preferred small, but steady stabilization. They were happy because they had actually everything. Their basic needs were satisfied. In mm. Poland we've got the same. Everybody is paying all this, uh, all, all, nearly all his money to the bank, but still, as long as they are not touched by, by direct violence, they, they are happy with this. So, is it really so, can we really saw that it will be actually regaining the, the, the identity, you know? The I think it's a passing phase, it's just a phase through which many nations come at one point or another when they prefer security for freedom. Uh, history showed to us that no nation can stay as such uh, in, in that condition. Sooner or later the nation realizes that the loss of uh, its identity, its freedom is more, is more dangerous for them that uh, everyday life, you know. Poland, of all nations, had sacrificed uh, a lot for its sovereignty, for its national identity. For centuries, you had to fight against your neighbors. Uh, anyone born in Poland and uh, learn anything about history of your country uh, would, would immediately see that the most important thing for Poles through centuries was their national identity and sovereignty of the state. You pay the huge price for it. I don't think that uh, something is going to change in Polish uh, genetic composition and they suddenly will decide that uh, as long as they give us a piece of bread, that's fine. I don't think it's going uh, to continue for long. It's the only passing phase. Now they suddenly got opportunity to become well-being, well-doing, you know, so they just grab for it. And they hope that would uh, give them happiness. Very soon they'll discover that it uh, doesn't give you happiness. It gives you a certain security, but it doesn't give you happiness. Unless you're totally free, you would never be happy. That's a, a tragedy of human being. We need both. We need security and happiness yeah, and freedom uh, in order to be uh, uh, to be happy. Uh, but it's very difficult to get both of them at the same time. So the Tower of Babel has to collapse due well, to I, I'm, the I'm human convinced. nature? I'm convinced of it. I, I just have no doubt whatsoever in my mind. 
12, about what, 10, 12 years ago, I made a speech in British Parliament explaining to them what's going to happen in Europe as a result of European integration. At that time, it was perceived with some uh, questions, some uh, re reservations, you know. They thought I'm a bit too extreme in my predictions. Now it became common knowledge. Now it's accepted everywhere. I use the term EUSSR to indicate the merger between Soviet Union and the European Union. Uh, now it's a common thing. You just uh, 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 click the Google with EUSSR, you will find millions of references to it. It became a commonly accepted model. Uh, so people don't understand what we're talking about. Gaspar Bukowski, what's your main dream, the biggest dream of your life? Well, I'm a bit too old to have any dreams, you know, most of my dreams... <laughs> but I will be very happy to see uh, disintegration of Russia and, uh, and the collapse of the European Union. It's, it's a kind of a very rare privilege to see two unions hostile to you collapsing in your lifetime. You know, it's twice rewarded. It's rewarding in itself. Mind you, it's going to be very punishing for the people, and that makes this reward somewhat bitter. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the people who suffered for that were uh, the ordinary people. The communist nomenclature didn't suffer at all. They became oligarchs. You know, they're doing well. It's the people who are least responsible for the Soviet system which got punished. The same is going to happen in Europe. All these politicians, they will have their millions and will live somewhere in, in the Bahamas or in, uh, in Bermuda, I, I don't know, in, in Canary Islands. And we will be paying uh, the bill for what they did. We will be paying the bill for our ignorance and being daft to what, the truth. What I am paying for, I can't understand. I wasn't ignorant, I, I've told it all. And yet, I am going to be punished for collapse of the European Union. But it's still your dream to see collapse. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Bukowski, it was honor and pleasure to receive well. this interview. Thank you very much. Pani Popadnego Radia Bolo, Stanowka, Polskiego, Cambridge. Thank you.